morning uh, and soon to be good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, my name is Frank Fernandez. Uh, I'm the President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta and I'm happy to be helping to kick off this portion of the conference. I'm very excited to be introducing uh, our two speakers for today, uh, as well as our, our friend Alex uh, with GPBI. Um, but before doing that, I just wanted to share a few remarks I was, I was thinking about before we started just the, the theme of today's uh, and really the last two days uh, conversations around uh, insights and really this focus on race, resilience and recovery. And part of why we are so supportive of this work is because you know, our mission really, really at its core is about how we as a community foundation bring together donors, the other foundations, the public sector and the private sector together to help tackle what are the biggest challenges in our region. Uh, and I would argue today that these issues and themes of race and resilience and recovery as it relates to these multiple crises we've been uh, really grappling with over the last few years are front and center to that. Uh, and so really excited to hear from our, our panelists today about the, 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 on their perspectives on that. You know, the, the Community Foundation, uh, I'm also excited because this is our 70th year. I've only been here five months, but we've been around 70 years uh, and really excited to be partnering with you all to think through how we move forward. Uh, the Community Foundation, as I said, that is central to our role. And we work with our donors and lots of others to, to try to have impact in the community. And one of the things that was very heartening about last year is that our donors really did uh, st step up and try to respond to these multiple crises and really gave more. And to the tune of in, in 2020, we ended up uh, being able to invest with our nonprofits over $170 million and really looking to see what we can do now that was so much focused on the response to the crisis. And now as we move into the next phase of into that response, how can we help to build together with folks on this call and, and hearing from our panelists, a more equitable and more inclusive recovery. So with that as hopefully a, a, a good frame, I wanna go ahead and start introducing our panelists. So I will start with, uh, Dr. Dorian Warren, uh, he is the president of Community Change and, and co-chair of the Economic Security Project and co-host of System Check. A progressive scholar, organizer, and media personality, Dorian has worked to advance racial, economic, and social justice for over two decades, since he was 10. And, uh, and Dr. Warren has received his MA and PhD in political science from Yale University. And, and a fun fact about Dr. Warren is that he loves crossword puzzles and it was doing one right before we started. So just so you know that about him. Next, I wanna go ahead and introduce Dr. Valerie Ralston Wilson. Uh, she's director of the Economic Policy Institute's program on race, ethnicity and the economy, PRE, a nationally recognized source for expert reports and policy analyses on the economic condition of America's people of color. Prior to joining EPI, uh, Dr. Wilson was an economist and vice president of research at the National Urban League, the, the Washington Bureau. Uh, she has received her PhD in economics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the fun fact about her is that she loves Duke. All right, <clears throat> the next one, Alex, our good friend Alex. He is a senior panel uh, policy analyst at GPBI where he produces research that shows ways to reduce poverty, improve social services, and provide support uh, for Georgia's workforce. Alex graduated from the University of Alabama. He also holds uh, a master in policy analysis and evaluation from Georgia State University, where he's now pursuing a doctorate in pol policy studies. Uh, and fun fact about Alex is that he loves the Georgia dog. So I'm glad you do. You're in the right place for that, Alex. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alex, who is going to kick us off, and we're going to hear from all our panelists. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Frank, for that. Um, uh, I did not know that about myself, um, but it's always good to keep learning things uh, introspectively about my, my sports fandom. Um, good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Uh, thank you so much, Frank, for that fantastic introduction. And thank you again to the Community Foundation uh, for supporting GBPI during this time. Thank you all for joining us today for our 2021 Insights keynote panel discussion on what is required, not just desired, 
for an anti-racist economic recovery in Georgia. If you're familiar with our speakers and have attended GBPI conferences in recent years, it should come as no surprise that we will not be dancing around or sugarcoating the issue at hand, which is that Georgia's economic landscape, particularly for low-wage workers, has always, and even in 2021, been defined by laws, not just isolated uh, interactions between individuals that reproduce racial and economic injustice. I have the distinct honor of moderating this conversation with two people in the field that I absolutely admire, and we have a lot to discuss, so let's begin. So to, to kick us off, uh, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Warren, uh, Valerie and Dorian, uh, you are both powerhouse advocates and researchers leading on economic policy debates, but more specifically, the role of race in the economy. It can take a lot of time and resources to understand the relationship between the two. And a lot of people still default to class to explain differences and access to economic opportunity. I would love if you could just describe for us how your own personal and professional journeys led you to centering the role of racism in economic policy. And Valerie, we can start with you. So good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, GBPI, for the opportunity uh, to be here. This is really a, a mutual admiration society. <laughs> I'm also a fan of, of all the work that Dorian has done, as well as the work, uh, Alex, that you're doing there in Georgia and with Taifa at GBPI. So this is an honor. And Frank, you're going to give me hurt with that kind of uh, introduction. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Duke fan, but 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 seriously, I, I hold no ill will against uh, Duke, although I know uh, that Carolina is actually the better school. Uh, so <laughs> in response <laughs> to the question, seriously, serious face. Okay. Uh, if you heard me speak at all, you know one of the things that I often say is that racism and class inequality are inextricably intertwined. We know that racism is baked into class inequality. You know, race determines where you are on the, the class structure economically and socially, but racial inequality also exists within class. And I think all people of color, in particular black people know this on some level. Uh, in terms of my own personal experience for me, I grew up in a two parent household. Both of my parents were college graduates. Uh, my father was an Air Force and Vietnam veteran, and he worked in banking as a loan officer. Uh, my mom was a teacher. She taught nearly every level of school and, and ultimately retired from the community college system uh, in Tarrant County in Texas. Our neighbors in our community were all professionals. My neighbors were teachers, lawyers, nurses, engineers, business owners, and the homes on our street sat directly across from an 18 hole golf course uh, of the Glen Garden Country Club. And there was a swimming pool at the end of the street. But we never used either of those. That's because in fact, only one family on our street had any chance of becoming a member of that club because they did not accept black members for most of the time that we lived there. And all of our neighbors, except for that one family, which was an older couple who resisted white flight were black. So every day we looked at something that was tangibly an example of the fact that class alone did not give us access to. And in fact, something that race uh, explicitly excluded us from. Now, professionally, um, I attended an HBCU, uh, Hampton University, uh, and in that experience, what first introduced me to economics as a profession were my black econ professors who recognized that, you know, I was doing well in the classes and really opened my eyes to the possibility of pursuing a PhD in economics and becoming a professional economist. Up to that point, the only economist frame of reference that I had was Alan Greenspan, who was the chair of the Federal Reserve at that time and didn't really make a connection there. Uh, the discipline of economics has always been interesting and appealing to me intellectually because I'm an analytical thinker and I'm pretty good at math. Um, but the economics profession is notorious for being dismissive 
of the realities of racism and is often hostile toward anyone who is not a white male. The way that I kind of brought those two things together, my experiences growing up and this sort of reality that I knew to be that class and race weren't always the same uh, thing, didn't give you access to the same things. I had mentors in grad school and professionally uh, who helped to model for me how I could use the tools of economics to reframe the debate on race in economic terms. And in doing that, really speak the language of the people who were often in, were in positions of power to change the policies that dictated how race and class um, sort of intersect and determine outcomes. So that's sort of where I come from in terms of my upbringing as well as professionally how, why I entered the field of economics and how I sort of bring the two together. Thank you so much for that. Dorian? Wow, well first, thanks to you, Alex. Thanks, Frank, for that introduction. Um, thanks to the entire GBPI team under the incredible leadership of Taitha Butler, support Black women's leadership, um, including Dr. Wilson here on this call. I always follow her leadership. And just to share, actually, Valerie, my mother was also a teacher and um, Frank, she was a math teacher, so I also do Sudoku. Um, and my father was also an Air Force and Vietnam veteran. Um, this partly, my answer to the question, Alex, is personal. So I grew up as a black kid on the South Side of Chicago where race and class were inseparable. They defined my lived experience. Uh, it was a working class black neighborhood, racially segregated, of course. Um, I grew up in a house that my grandparents, who were both union janitors, bought in 1954. When they bought that house, they were the, only the third black family on the block. By 1960, the block was all black because of white flight. That shaped the opportunity structure for my own life. If you think of the quality of public schools in my neighborhood, um, the safety of the neighborhood. Um, but I also learned another lesson at a young age, and that was around the power of collective action to change the rules and policies that affect poor and working class black communities. My mother was a public school teacher, as I just mentioned, and my earliest political memory is on a picket line with her at the age of seven, when mostly black women and women teachers went on strike um, in a very intersectional way, right? They were bringing together racial justice, class, economic justice, and gender justice. We didn't have the language like that in 1983, but it was really important for me to learn that lesson early on. The other thing that happened in 1983 in Chicago was the election of the first African-American mayor, Harold Washington, who actually um, was very progressive and showed how to combine an analysis of race and class, and particularly racial and economic inequality in terms of city policies to redistribute resources, particularly to black and brown um, poor and working class neighborhoods. Professionally, let me just say a quick word here. I've always sought analytically to use the tools of social science to understand American capitalism, American racial capitalism. And early on in my academic career, I always thought debates about race versus class were off the mark it was sort of a non-starter. It's not race versus class. It's, there's an improv principle called yes and, it's like all the above. So it's race and class and gender and geography are all deep causes of inequality. And so as a researcher, I spent many years trying to understand these, this complex inequality in the American system. But as an organizer, I, I spent some time organizing um, hotel workers, particularly women of color and black women who didn't have the luxury of saying it's just class or it's just race or it's just gender. They lived at the intersection. And so that was early on in my development to understand, um, to use an analogy by Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres, how there are many minors canaries in our political and economic system. It's the title of their book. And the quick story of the miners canary is that miners would take a canary into the coal mines because canaries had tiny lungs. And so if there were toxic gases in the mines, canaries would get sick and even die. And it alerted the miners to the danger of the system. And I often think of as black women as the miners canaries of our political and economic system in this country. Or you might think of undocumented immigrants and meatpacking, um, six of whom just died in your state, right, <laughs> this week. So those are the miners canaries and the miners canaries tell us something about the dangers in the system that end up affecting everybody. So I have always focused on who are the miners canaries in any given situation? What do they tell us about the system? 
how do we then disrupt and transform those systems with new rules, new policies, new norms, new ideas of freedom and justice, and of course, rules of democracy. So let me stop there because I've said way too much. <laughs> No, no, I mean, that is so important. And we pose that question first because I feel like people don't realize, you know, how much goes in, how much lived experience, how much, you know, we draw from the realities of structural racism and of segregation and like how much that lives in our memory uh, that makes us, you know, want to be more effective and imagine kind of like a different way of doing economic policy that is racially just. And, you know, I think back to last year, uh, we had Nicole Hannah Jones as our uh, keynote speaker, and she talked about. Oh, just her. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, no pressure, but you know, she brought into the room the the role of that 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 living memory, like being in the trenches and experiencing segregation firsthand, and that's something that folks in in today believe is just so distant, like it doesn't exist, it's not real. Um, but it's it, in fact very real and it permeates public policy as we've um, already discussed so far. Um, next, next question though, uh, Dorian, you know, you actually co-authored a book uh, titled The Hidden Rules of Race. It was published in 2017. You picked apart that common bootstrap uh, mentality that is baked into economic policy as well. And it, that, you know, from our perspective and, and from yours too, and as you write, actively disadvantages a lot of people of color in this country. Um, since then, there have been a lot of other books that have come forward and, and have joined the course, such as How to Be Anti-Racist and CAST. Um, and many people and businesses, politicians and institutions are showing a newfound interest in, in race equity and inclusion. Now, uh, we have experienced a full Trump presidency, um, a global public health crisis that has disproportionately affected Black and Brown folks and another year of protests and uprisings. Is there anything you would have written differently mm -hmm. knowing we would have the last four years that we have just experienced? <laughs> well, uh, probably not. The only thing I probably would change is the title of the book and it would probably be retitled The Hidden and the Visible Rules of Race. Um, if you think of January 6th, and I'm gonna come back to this point in a minute, and the Confederate symbol literally in the halls of the Capitol building. Um, that's visible. <laughs> so I don't think I, I would change much because we've seen versions of the story before in our history. And let me just say a, a few words on this. So, I, I, you know, in America, we have contradictory traditions. We have a long tradition, since you mentioned Nicole Hannah Jones, starting in 1619, of domination of white oligarchic rule based on, I'm going to use the terms, racial capitalism, white supremacy. And political violence, very important, has always been central to our systems of domination, whether it's exclusion or exploitation, vis-a-vis vis -vis laws and rules. That's one tradition. And then we have another tradition of resistance and transformation, of strategic nonviolent disruption and protest, of, elect of elections, of narrative change, of organizing, of social movements. And so we have these two traditions in American politics from the founding. And so on January 6th is where these two traditions meet. Right, we woke up to the improbable news that Georgia, Georgia, once one of the old, it was once the cradle of the old Confederacy, one of the major cotton producing slave states, Stone Mountain, the Mount Rushmore of the Confederacy, was the site of the rebirth of the KKK in 1915. The carvings in Stone Mountain, right, of Confederate leaders, General Robert Lee, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson, President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Dayson, Jefferson Davis, that's like all right there where you are. Right. And then yet, yet with that history on the on that morning, we had this improbable victory, right, of a 33 year old Jewish man, the senior pastor of Dr. King's historic church of Ebenezer, both won Senate seats, giving Democrats the majority in the Senate and a, and a trifecta. Now, that's so improbable until it's not because of a decade of grassroots organizing and building of infrastructure to create that political earthquake. So then we have this like history, this historical context of the state of Georgia, this incredible victory. And then just a few hours later, we witnessed a traitorous, seditious, white supremacist insurrection on the United States Capitol, the very symbol of our democracy. And what's not lost on me is, as I mentioned before, the Confederate symbol or version of the Confederate flag, right, made its way inside the Capitol building, never happened during the Civil War. 
let's remember the Capitol building was of course built by enslaved black people. And yes, their children, black enslaved children helped to build that Capitol building. So now in hindsight, the events of January 6th are both surprising and not surprising the long sweep of American history that I, I write about with my co-authors in the book. And to, to, to paraphrase another book, it's, it's the unsteady march, two steps forward, one step back. So whether it's the end of reconstruction in the 1870s and 1880s that gave rise to Jim Crow authoritarian governments in the South, um, or you might think of the Colfax massacre in Louisiana in 1873 or the Wilmington riot in 1898 in North Carolina, a successful white supremacist political coup, by the way, you know better than I do in Georgia what it's like to what it was like to live under Jim Crow authoritarian governments for over a hundred years. And so just to wrap up, what did we expect after Obama? What did we expect after that presidency? Backlash attempts at like Jim Crow 2.0. So ultimately, like our forebears, we are in this epic struggle between those two contradictory histories and traditions in American history, one of racial hierarchy of a white Christian republic versus another tradition around racial justice and transformation. And, um, and that is the task ahead of us. So the, you know, I, I don't think I would change anything about the book. The good news is we now have more frameworks, whether it's a cast analysis or other kinds of analysis. These are frameworks and tools that help us understand the world. And then the question, there's a strategy question we'll come to of, and that is what is to be done therefore about these systems that um, continue to keep low-income people, black folks, people of color, those on the margins. How do we transform and disrupt and redesign systems that promote freedom and thriving for everybody? You got me there. Like the, the the strategy question is what I, you know, posits to folks who are now reading all the texts, right? Like, what's the strategy? What are we taking from this and putting into to practice? You know, uh, we can talk to talk all day. Let's walk the walk. Um, Valerie, you know, at, at EPI or Economic Policy Institute, um, particularly through the work that you're leading through the program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, you've elevated the role of racism in the job market. Um, a few months ago, uh, you co-authored a piece stating that Black and Latinx workers face two of the most lethal pre-existing conditions for COVID-19, racism and economic inequality. And throughout the presidential election cycle and even the runoff cycle here in Georgia, we heard often as a political talking point that we are experiencing the lowest Black unemployment in our nation's history, despite the persisting gaps that have widened during the pandemic recession. So for instance, the national rate in December in terms of the unemployment rate was 6% for white Americans, while the rate is 10% for black Americans. So given your analysis of employment and wages and perhaps any others you wanna share, how should policymakers and the general public, everyday consumers of this information really interpret that, that counterpoint that we're you know, marching towards uh, economic progress because the black unemployment rate is headed downwards? Yeah, well, you know, I, I start by acknowledging that it is true that in 2019, uh, we did have the lowest Black unemployment rate on record. Uh, the average for the year was 6.1%. But that's only half of the story. And when we think about historically, the historical record is horrendous. So <laughs> to have the lowest in history doesn't say a lot. Um, one of the most defining features of the U.S. labor market is the large and persistent disparity in unemployment that exists between Black and white workers. We can typically characterize that disparity by the ratio of two to one. So in 2019, when we had 6.1% record low Black unemployment, the white unemployment rate was 3%. Uh, and even at those historically low rates, that was the case, not just overall, but also at nearly every level of education. So what does that mean? In practical terms, that means that Black workers are not only twice as likely to be unemployed as white workers, uh, similarly educated white workers, but are often more likely to be unemployed than less educated white workers as well. Among the employed, uh, black workers face large pay disparities relative to white workers. And these black white wage gaps, as we often refer to them, have actually grown over the last 40 years. 
Another important point to understand about that is that those large uh, wage gaps are not explained. They're largely unexplained by factors that we commonly associate with individual productivity, like education or work experience. And in fact, less than half of the observed black white difference in, in the average hourly wage is explained by factors presumed to be productivity related and thus determine pay. So most of that gap we can explain by things that we often say people need to do in order to get ahead. So then we come to COVID-19. On the heels of record low unemployment, we still <clears throat> witnessed the needlessly heavy burden that COVID-19 imposed on communities of color. And the way that uh, my colleague, my co-author on the, those reports, uh, Elise Gould and I have characterized uh, the COVID-19 economy is that it basically uh, divided workers into three groups. The first group is obvious. It's the tens of millions of workers who lost their jobs when the pandemic and recession hit. The second group of workers are those who were classified as essential workers, so they had some degree of job security, but they faced greater health insecurity because by being essential, they had to physically go into work to do their job. The third group of workers are those who were able to continue working safely from their homes and protect both their economic well-being as well as their health. Uh, Black, Latinx, Native American, low-income workers were the least likely to be in that last group and had few good options to protect both their economic well-being and their health. So when we think about uh, just some summary statistic like the unemployment rate, we miss a lot of the structural inequities underlying those numbers and really the quality of the kinds of employment that people of color have access to relative to white Americans. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, you know, DBPI has been, you know, hitting the make, you know, hitting the drums on that for a while now. Uh, my colleague Ray has recently written a piece that talks about the unemployment rate. You know, lifted up as the sole factor or sole metric that we use to measure our recovery. Uh, when in fact, you know, it, it's not the sole measure. I mean, there's so many other uh, things that get missed whenever we. We just focus on the, youth, the unemployment rate. And then on top of that, you know, it's never disaggregated. And, you know, we don't look at what it looks like in rural areas versus, you know, maybe Metro Atlanta. Um, so I really appreciate you talking about that. And then also talking about when folks, particularly Black folks, are employed, what the quality of employment looks like. Are those jobs meaningful jobs um, or not? Um, this is actually a good segue, because now we're going to talk about markets. <laughs> uh, speaking of racial capitalism. Um, I, I want to talk about the role of markets because they do play a big role in how we do policy here in Georgia. Um, you know, it seems timely, uh, actually, given the latest uh, stock market GameStop fiasco, which quite frankly goes right over my head. I, I don't really know what, what went down, but I, I see that it's taken up a lot of the, um, the Twitterverse. So, you know, in Georgia and uh, across the nation, we're really plagued by policies that put the health of markets over the health of people. And Georgia, uh, you know, our leadership often says that, um, or we repeatedly ranked as number one place to do business, um, along with many other states, ironically, but we're at the bottom of the list when it comes to other factors such as health coverage, educational outcomes, poverty rates, and overall child well being. Um, but those business first policies are still peddled as a solution, and it's, it's a bipartisan tactic, right? Like it's not really. Uh, you know, shared on one side versus the other. And I, I even recall, you know, last year, you know, Biden, you know, was stating that he doesn't expect the government to, to solve his problems when he was discussing the need for COVID relief um, on the heels of the November uh, jobs report. Um, so this, this obsession, you know, with being the number one place to do business, you know, in our view, tends to come at a, at a pretty significant cost, like cuts to the safety net and the budget, uh, wages are kept criminally low. For those watching who don't know Georgia's minimum wage, state minimum wage is $5.15 an hour. It's the lowest in the nation. Uh, and even in this last year, it's you know contributed to the eroding of protections for workers who need, uh, particularly essential workers who need support in the workplace. Um, so lastly, it's also pitched as a race neutral solution. Like market solutions are race neutral. 
Um, that is, you know, interesting, right? <laughs> because all of the effects that I just named tend to have a disproportionate effect on, on people of color, Black folks, particularly our immigrant neighbors. So in your view, are market solutions to economic issues race neutral? I guess I'll go ahead and, and take that one. <laughs> uh, uh, Alex, I don't know where to go from there. I mean, you basically <laughs> summed it all up. Uh, in, <laughs> in theory, uh, free market solutions are race neutral, but we all know that we don't live in a theoretical world and life in this country is far from race neutral. Uh, markets operate according to the structures in place. And the outcomes of those structures are determined by access, who has access, who has power. So they are anything but free in reality. Uh, access and power, as we know, are also distributed on the lines of race, socioeconomic status, gender, we can go on down the line. But another problem with looking at free markets as the sole solution or a race neutral solution is that we often find that the well being of workers is at odds with the profit maximizing motives of business. Um, and so, you know, the idea that the government isn't going to solve problems is, is actually false because the government often creates problems. Policy determines which way the nation's income and wealth will flow. But we also know that wealth has had an outsized influence on politics. So to think that you know we can really sort of separate all of these things, politics, wealth, business, government intervention, uh, it, it's false. All of those things are related. The markets are going to function accor according to the underlying structures. And those structures are historically and continue to be unequal because of the policies that have been advanced uh, for decades that have tipped the scales in favor of those uh, with access to wealth and the owners of capital, as we say often in economics. I'm gonna riff off Dr. Wilson for a minute because I do think um, market free market solutions are, there's never, no such thing as race neutrality. And in fact, it's always an empirical question. And um, I would argue actually, that in the American context, um, you can have two kinds of policies and rules, policies and rules that exacerbate racial inequality or policies and rules that tackle it head on. Markets are made up of rules and the rules are too often created by the powerful, and right? And so part of our fight is to get other voices to help set the agenda and to make new rules that advance freedom and justice and equity. Um, I'm struck by the question, Alex, because I've been reading this fantastic new book by my former colleague at the Roosevelt Institute, Mike Konzel, and the book is entitled Freedom from the Market. And the argument there is that true freedom requires freedom from the market, right? It requires government to provide vital, vital services and public goods directly and universally so we don't rely on the marketplace or market thinking. Freedom from the market also means being free from arbitrary power and domination. And the workplace is still the most non-democratic institution in America. And this is really personal for me as I think about it because um, Valerie mentioned essential workers. My sister and brother in Chicago, they actually live in the very same house I grew up in <laughs> that I mentioned earlier. They're classified as essential workers and they were compelled to work during this COVID-19 pandemic. My sister-in-law is a cook at Whole Foods. She contracted COVID by going to work. My brother-in-law works in, in computers and tech. He was um, installing computers at a nursing home, contracted COVID. They then took it home and my five-year-old nephew contracted COVID. So the marketplace, the workplace actually put them at greater risk. And that's really personal, right? Like their health and safety was at risk. And that's not freedom. That's compulsion, compulsion to work in a market. I also want to note that the, the rise of the notion of free markets or what some might call neoliberalism or the idea that markets will solve all problems and government is the enemy, it's ideological. That's not science. Um, and I come at this um, from a little different perspective, although let me just say Dr. Wilson is one of the, the champions for a different kind of a 
economics, I tend to think um, in the last 40 years, economists have had too much power <laughs> in our policymaking. I, this is the disciplinary bias, Valerie, because I'm a political scientist, so I think a lot about power and democracy and freedom and justice. But just to note, the notion of free markets, there is a Southern origin story here, because the notion of free markets arose out of resistance to desegregation in the South. This notion that public goods, which have previously been white exclusive public goods, Valerie mentioned swimming pool, um, in her, her personal story, but thinking about education, that the notion in the South in the 50s and 60s and resistance to desegregation was to privatize public goods. And so wealthy white folks could then take their kids out of the public school and send them to a very elite private school as part of the resistance to desegregation. Or to take some other examples, um, I just wanna go back to this book by Mike Conzo. We, have, we don't know, even know our own history. So there was a time during World War II where the government created daycare centers because they needed workers and they needed women workers because men were shipped off to war. And so they actually created daycare centers for their women workers without the stigma attached to many of our programs. Or to use another example, Medicare in the 1960s. Medicare was used as a tool to eliminate Jim Crow and desegregate Southern hospitals. It was actually a federal public program used to advance racial and economic justice. Um, or we forget our own history of the norm of free college in this country for over a decade that then got replaced by market logic student loans. We're having a whole debate about that now. So neoliberalism, free market ideology, it's made us forget our own history, including, and, and I'll end on this point, our own history of reconstruction in the South. And it's never lost on me, if you go back and read W.B. Du Bois and many others, the first time there were free public schools in the South was part of the reconstruction project and particularly the Freedmen's Bureau that for the first time created public education from which former enslaved people and poor whites alike benefited. So that those weren't market interventions. Those were interventions of particularly the federal government. And so we, it, it is both, you know, I'm just gonna say it, there is an ideological fight that is not based in sound social science around this free market ideology that we have to push back against. And, you know, I think this is a period of a proliferation of alternative visions around the role of governments and the role of providing public goods and securing um, equity for all in this moment. I, I love that. I mean, and the reason why I asked the question, even though I may have summed it up <laughs> very shortly is because we, I think, struggle with the language around that. You know, we have a narrative, uh, maybe it is a problem. I'll just come out and say, it. we have a narrative problem. Yes. When it comes to talking about the role of government and the role of, you know, private markets and ultimately what's best for, for the public good. And, and you know, it's challenging to, to fight against that, that more, uh, I would say, dominant narrative discourse mm -hmm. around the role mm -hmm. of corporations, particularly looking at, you know, tax policy and the tax code and the way that economic development incentive deals are administered and, um, and then, you know, takes away from things that we believe could fundamentally be better for the public good. Um, and, so yeah, thank you so much for going into the deep dive on that. And I love the fact that we can hard, hope our audience can start developing some good language around, um, around that and combating that here. All right, um, on a similar note, speaking of neoliberalism, yeah, um, talk a little bit about, about public assistance and the safety net that people need to thrive um, and to guarantee a more equitable recovery. In 2020, a colleague and I published a report on temporary assistance for needy families um, that explains the racist history of cash assistance uh, in Georgia and, and really across the country. In the report, we explained how welfare queen tropes and racial terrorism in Georgia were used to restrict cash aid uh, from folks, which currently today is only limited to about five in every 100 Georgia families in poverty. We recommend making TANF, which is again, our, our state's only cash aid program, as least restrictive or anti-racist as possible, rolling back those very explicitly racist uh, provisions within TANF. But I'm, I'm really curious to know, I mean, do you think it's possible to make a policy that is defined by racism, anti-racist? Uh, I mean, what does a truly anti-racist safety net for no income or low income families look like. And you know, I'll remind our, our audiences, you know, that TANF, which was previously aid to families with dependent children, 
you know, has it's rife with decades and decades, almost a century of, of uh, racist uh, tropes and, and other um, harmful uh, stereotypes about people of color and women. So um, what is, what's y'all's take on that? Valerie, we can start with you. Um, it is difficult uh, because I think that anything that is even perceived to be of a benefit to people of color will be challenged and will come under attack. And, you know, uh, you know, again, thinking about history and people being sort of blind to history when they want to be, it's always amazing to me that in a country and an economic system that built its wealth on free labor suddenly has a problem or is concerned with people getting something for nothing. Uh, so there's a disconnect there, you know, it's good for some and not for others. Uh, in terms of, of the kinds of programs or policies that we need, historically, some of the most successful uh, anti-poverty programs have been those that are uh, universal in nature, but have a progressive sort of benefit structure. Uh, Social Security is one that comes to mind, but again, we have to be aware of our history. Even Social Security, when it was initially uh, designed, had uh, occupational exclusions uh, that limited uh, people of color from access uh, to those benefits. So again, even if we have a universal policy that's progressive in nature, sort of the, the devil is often in the details and how that policy is designed can affect who has access to those benefits or not. I think, you know, now when we think about a lot of the policies that are uh, in place, uh, TANF is one example, uh, so often uh, those benefits are tied to work. So again, this idea that you have to do something, you have to give something uh, to be deserving or worthy of help. Uh, you know, a lot of the policies, the minimum wage, EITC, are all good things and I think important things. But again, it's tied to this idea of work. So I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is really overcoming uh, this notion of deservingness, who's worthy of help and who isn't. Uh, and that kind of structure really is centered on an individual. Again, this probably gets back to a lot of the discussion when we think about uh, free markets and, and the labor market uh, discussion about uh, uh, employment and wages and you need to get more training, you need to get more education so you can advance. Everything is so centered on the individual uh, with less concern and um, consideration uh, of the fact that what's best for the individual is also best for the well-being of communities, cities, states, and nation. I think it's helpful to sort of probably start from thinking about what's, what's better for the broader community of people first and designing policies from that standpoint, as opposed to thinking about, okay, individuals have to do this to qualify to get some benefit. What kind of country do we have? Do we want to have? How uh, much stability economically do we want in this country? To do that, it's really about looking, starting globally, and then thinking about how that influences individuals. I think that by centering the needs of those who face uh, the greatest economic harm, that we uh, improve the overall effectiveness of any policy response. And given uh, the structural racism that has existed in this country for years. By doing that, we also uh, are able to minimize those longstanding disparities by race, ethnicity, gender, and class. So I think it really starts with sort of getting beyond this frame of the individual being the focus of everything and thinking about what kind of communities, cities, states, nation do we want to have and what is the best thing um, what are the best policies for accomplishing that goal? Not about punitive, who deserves, who needs to be punished because they didn't get enough uh, years in school, et cetera. Yeah, and I'll, again, I'm gonna riff off the wise Dr. Wilson's comments. Um, I'm gonna use the S word to start. Um, we have, in this country, we have socialism for the wealthy and a mean capitalism for the rest of us. 
We don't blink an eye to, corp to bail out corporations in economic crises. But when it comes to people and ordinary people and especially people of color and low income people, oh, then we need work requirements and other right um, um, guardrails, right? So um, having said that, I do fundamentally believe we can redesign anything any set of policies or systems with our with principles of racial equity and racial and economic justice. And to use Dr. Wilson's example of social security, we did engage in a redesign process to ensure that those who had been excluded, agricultural and domestic workers who at the time were super majority black um, and now mostly immigrant, we redesigned that program to make it more inclusive. So I do think there is a principle of redesign and some design thinking that we should hold with us. But this is all a power question because we need good ideas. And we need alternative ideas of what a safety net looks like. But as a friend of mine likes to say, power eats good ideas for breakfast. So we also need organizing because policies and rules, and this is the political scientist in me speaking, policies and rules are simply power relations frozen in a moment in time. And what we can win um, depends on the power of really ordinary people in the collective. This is the role of social movements and organizing to bend political will towards new ideas and new policies. I'm, I think a lot about, and, and you probably know I'm involved in some guaranteed income experiments in Mississippi and in Stockton, California and Compton. And I'm gonna say a few words about this. The idea though, those guaranteed income experiments, particularly the one in Mississippi that's all, that's focused on black mothers and public housing, the attempt there goes right at, it goes right at the heart of the deep racist and sexist stigma of deservingness as Valerie talked about. And it's both a policy fight, a political fight, but it's a cultural and narrative fight at the same time. Now, let me be quick to say, I don't think guaranteed income is a magic bullet. It's not a silver bullet. I do wanna point out it comes out of a black political tradition, whether it was MLK, Dr. King or the Black Panther Party, or most importantly, the National Welfare Rights Organization of black women who warned us in the 60s about these kinds of um, work requirements and stinginess and frankly racism and sexism attached to our social welfare program. So we need all the ideas on the table, including, and Valerie's been leading on this, ideas about worker power and the building of a new social contract that'll provide economic security for everyone. And just to close, I, I, I tend to be obsessed um, and was looking to other countries for ideas too, in addition to our, to our own resources in this country, but I'm obsessed with New Zealand, who recently um, under the prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, um, decided to move from just a simple measuring of gross domestic product to broaden now to other measures of well-being to set government policy and allocations of resources. So they've broadened out their idea of well-being to include poverty, to include mental health, to include domestic violence. So there are lots of other ideas out there. And our role is, at least for me as, as sort of the organizer, is to build the political will to win on some of these great new ideas that are, again, that Dr. Wilson and others have been, have been putting out for years, as well as in other places around the world. Alex, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> the organize, as a millennial, I should know how to unmute myself. Um, the organizing aspect, I think, is so crucial. Um, the political will conversation is one that we will have, we can have agnos to agnosium. I mean, it is just, you know, something that I know our leadership at GBPI uh, constantly, you know, instills in a lot of our partners and our allies that no matter what recommendations we can put as many policy reports and briefs out into the world, as many ideas out into the world as possible about what we think should be done. Uh, but if we don't have the political will to make it happen, then you know, we're just kind of going in circles there. So I thank you for, for lifting that up. Thank you both. Almost um, in, that, in that same theme, and really my final question um, for, for both of you to chime in on, but starting with you, Dorian, uh, community change is focused on community organizing. And, and Valerie, EPI is a, is a research institute. Um, while the policy goals may be similar, um, sometimes research organizations develop solutions in a vacuum. Um, what challenges uh, would, or what challenge, I guess you, I should say, would each of you give to research organizations uh, like an EPI or even a GBPI, um, and even our philanthropic sector as well, 
who are looking to partner oh, with. I have a lot to say about funders, but okay, I'll let you finish your question. <laughs> I, I'm sure you do. Well, I mean, what 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 challenge would you give to them that, especially mm. those that want to partner with community organizers um, and even our nonprofit partners and allies who provide direct services, uh, specifically to advance economic and racial justice in Georgia and across the South? So let me go back to a point I made earlier about power. Power. Change is about power. And, and I would break it down in three ways. We need ideas, and particularly policy ideas around redesigning or constructing new systems. We need organizing to be able to win those ideas. And then of course, politics, right? And you're in some serious political fights in the state of Georgia, I know, because I follow y'all on Twitter in terms of the state budget, um, K through 12, like all the things, Medicaid, all the things, right? Medicaid expansion, K through 12, like you're in, you're, so, and you're fighting on those three dimensions in the ideas space in terms of policy ideas around organizing and around politics. So I would say you already have an infrastructure of grassroots community organizations in Georgia that, hey, something happened in November that was unexpected, if I recall. Something happened on January 5th that was unexpected, if I recall. And, you know, the Georgia budget center is already engaged with New Georgia Project, Georgia 9 to 5, Southern Economic Advancement Project, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Atlanta Jobs with Justice, I'm sure some churches. So you're already doing the strategic alignment. You are actually doing what you're the model for other places around the country. And so let me say this to funders then, very clearly and directly. Hi, funders. <laughs> Thanks for stepping up this past year. We need you to do more. And you have to take an ecosystem approach to how can the state of Georgia be transformed and what does it mean? How can you step it up even more as funders to forge these strategic alignments with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute with these grassroots community organizations. And I'm not talking about one year grants because that's like, that's 20th century. 21st century philanthropy that wants to be transformative. Y'all need to step up and give GBPI and many of their partners five year grants of general operating support because that's how, that was the, that's the formula for how Georgia turned blue over a decade, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen in one year grant cycles. It's gonna take years of organizing, years of the policy research, years of putting out ideas, cultural narrative work that needs to be resourced. And what Georgia actually has shown is that when you resource well, you have transformative effects. So it's just a little nudge to my funder friends that are listening. This is the group and the ecosystem that needs your support now in this really important historical moment in our country and in the state of Georgia. I'm going to uh, co-sign on everything that Dorian just said, <laughs> but I'm also, uh, I want to expand with a, a very practical step and example uh, that I and we at EPI have taken on this front. The last several years, I can't tell you how many calls and emails I received uh, from people uh, wanting to understand how to better center race in the work that they do. And this is largely from the DC-based research and, and policy community that uh, was familiar uh, with PRE and the work that I do there. Um, we at EPI even were working to shift more towards centering race in all that we do. Now we've always uh, included uh, analysis of, of racial uh, inequity in the research that we uh, have done. Um, but you know, even we wanted to step it up. In that process, in those conversations, uh, it quickly became clear to me that the intentions, the good intentions and in wanting to do that weren't always matched with doing that in a constructive manner. Uh, so uh, we just wrapped up a seven part a workshop series that I developed called Turning Good Intentions into Constructive Engagement on Race. Uh, and the audience for that series was the DC-based policy and research community. Uh, but in nearly all of those sessions, the approach that we took was to bring in someone from grassroots organizing. We uh, partnered with the Center for Popular Democracy uh, and Groundwork Collaborative and putting these on, uh, bringing in someone from that community to co-facilitate within uh, academic or technical 
expert because we wanted people to understand uh, that the questions that guide your research and policy have to first be informed by a clear understanding of the problem. So from the research side, that's what it starts with. It starts with the way, the questions that we ask, the way that we interpret the results of our research. That's where it, where it all begins. And in order to do that, we have to know what all the issues and problems are. Uh, we had a session specifically on developing effective partnerships uh, with racial justice focused advocates and activists. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me as examples of why this is important. One, uh, implementation is just as important as intent of a policy. Uh, we had an example of uh, Make the Road New York was our co-facilitator uh, in, in this session. And they were giving an example of, of public assistance programs and they were trying to organize people uh, to advocate for, I can't remember exactly what the change was, but some improvement in, in the public assistance program. Uh, there were issues, there were things that needed to be worked out, but, but there was a barrier that was even more fundamental than that. Many of the people in the communities that they are organized are people for whom English is a second language or they're solely Spanish speaking only households. And so in order for them to even voice their concerns, express that they were having a problem uh, with the program and the implementation of the program, they had to get in touch with their caseworker. Well, many times there was a language barrier between them and the caseworker. So even if there, you know, even if there was a path for them to express their concern or contact someone to get the help that they needed, the fact that there was a language barrier created a problem. So there in designing the policy, it would be important to understand who the target community was and what needed to happen in order for that policy to be fully implemented and be successful in those communities. So that was one example of why it's important to sort of align and understand the two. The second uh, example was something that was said at the end of that session that I found really powerful. Uh, the presenter was reminding us as the audience, as the policy audience, uh, how much power that we had in terms of our access to policymakers, the fact that we can make a call, send an email, shoot a report or some data uh, to folks who are in a position to change policy, you know, put us in a position, a relative position of power. Whereas for them to get that kind of message across, it required people getting up at the crack of dawn and getting on the bus and traveling for miles to come to DC and show up in the offices to make that case. So understanding that what it took for us to get that message ac across relative to them really to me was really profound and really uh, enlightening. And I think that the point there is that we both have to understand how important it is that those communities are connected and how much more powerful we can both be uh, when we share a unified message and purpose. In DC, we're probably not gonna go out and organize people, put bodies in the streets to make a statement that gets attention, not just the policymakers, but gets the nation's atten attention. That's something that, that organizers can uniquely do. For them, as, as was the example, you know, I, I don't know how many uh, uh, congressmen, senators are gonna open an email and read you know, a, a report or some <laughs> statistics from just the citizen, you know, that we get that level of credibility as the quote unquote experts. And so it's really important and, and really much more powerful when those two groups of people know each other, understand each other, work together uh, and really put forward a unified message and have a unified purpose in advancing those things. Thank you for that. And I agree. I mean, the solidarity between our groups are, it's important, it's critical. Um, I appreciate you, Dorian, too, for lifting up the ecosystem approach. That is so vital. Um, from your perspective, you know, seeing kind of a, a shift in the South and in Georgia, I'm glad you connected the dots between the ecosystem and that. Uh, for our audiences, happy to remind folks that we are a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> so uh, we stick to the, the facts and the policy debates um, and, and don't wade into the elections um, as much, but uh, that ecosystem is real. <laughs>
and it's powerful. Um, and, and, and investing, I think, in uh, you know multiracial, uh, anti-racist policy organizing and research, you know, is definitely one way to contribute to that ecosystem. Um, so we are actually um, a little ahead, and we've got time about ten minutes for some questions and answers, and we have quite a few. Um, but I do want to know if we don't get to your questions uh, during this call, we're cataloging these and we will follow up with you to address any questions you may have. But um, I have pulled up here some that we may be able to fit in um, quickly. Uh, this one uh, comes from a viewer uh, talking about capitalism. This is a, a big one. Um, uh, could you talk, either one of you, um, please feel free to answer. Could you talk about the influence of the institution of slavery on the development of American capitalism? And this feels very academic, but uh, if there's uh, a perspective you want to share, please feel free. How much time do we have? Uh, I know, right? Um, <laughs> For right that now, question alone, I mean, that's like a week long seminar. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll try to start, Valerie, um, but need your help here. Uh, there, let me just point to two things. One is the accumulation of wealth and of white wealth based on, as Valerie said earlier, unfree um, labor by enslaved black people. And um, here's the number I use often to think about 1619 to the present, 25, 10 and five. Those are decades. First 25 decades of this country was a system of racial slavery of enslaved black people. So the first 25 decades, free labor, wealth accumulation, somebody accumulated that wealth, it didn't go away. And frankly, it didn't get redistributed. And indeed, so after that first 25 decades, you have civil war, then you have the second number was 10. Um, you have a brief period of reconstruction. Really the only thing that Southern oligarchs in particular lost were property in the form of enslaved people. That's like all they lost. <laughs> and then they quickly got it back because the next 10 decades was Jim Crow in the South. There's a famous book called Slavery by Another Name, which is essentially what Jim Crow was. So that's the next 10 decades of, again, the ex exploitation of, um, of Black people in particular in the South and of our labor and the, and the stripping of wealth from Black communities specifically. So first 25 decades, uh, racialized slavery, next 10 decades, Jim Crow, and then it's basically only been five decades since roughly the mid 60s of one, some notion of democracy in Southern states after the 65 Voting Rights Act, and two, some ability, some small ability, Dr. Wilson could speak much more about this, to accumulate some Black wealth. But then if you look at the Black, the wealth gap today, the racial wealth gap today, Mm, where does that leave us? So that's that's the effect of capitalism, of racial capitalism in America, right? From the founding to the present. And here we are in a, with deep inequalities and particularly deep racial inequalities. Um, the second aspect about capitalism in America is we have waged fights, policy fights, political fights, narrative fights to, trans, to disrupt and transform the system in ways that promote e equality and equity and freedom. So I don't, you know, on our side, we tend to um, forget sometimes that we win some big fights. We are often the little Davids um, against Goliaths and too much of, <laughs> I think on our side, as, as Anat Shankar Sario says, when, when the biography is written of David and Goliath, people write the biography of Goliath and not of the Davids and the ordinary people, particularly women and women of color who are at the forefront of these fights over time to disrupt and transform systems. So uh, there's so much more to say about the role of capitalism, but I will toss to my, my dear colleague, Dr. Wilson to, to spit some facts. <laughs> so I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, when we think about our identity in this country as Americans, and so that's, that's where I'm gonna take it. Capitalism is so ingrained in our idea of who we are in this country. The American dream is, is built on capitalism. You come, you work hard, you, you get a good job, you buy a house, uh, you, know, you can retire, send your kids to college. That idea is built on capitalism. If you work hard, 
you're going to reap the benefits of that hard work. Um, but unfortunately, again, the, the structure uh, of the system from the beginning uh, set rules in place on who was going to benefit <laughs> and who wasn't. And in setting those rules, it really tipped the balance of the scale to advantage uh, white Americans, in particular white men, uh, at the same time that it, it oppressed, uh, excluded, uh, discriminated against uh, everyone else uh, who did not have that identity. And so as we continue to try to develop and improve upon capitalism and improve on democracy in this country, uh, we're constantly pushing against that initial frame and really trying to distribute power and wealth more broadly so that we can re you know, really uh, uh, realize that dream or that ideal of, of, of democracy and democratic capitalism. Uh, and just quite frankly, just point blank, who benefits in capitalism is based on who controls what we call the factors of production in economics and, and how we value those factors. Uh, it's capital and labor, pretty much is what it comes down to. Uh, capital is what builds wealth disproportionately. Uh, the rest of us are the labor. And we know that, you know, that can vary widely also based on your race and ethnicity, what position that you have uh, as a, a laborer. Uh, your race, ethnicity, and gender determine that, in, as well as the, the pay that you receive, the wages you receive, the kinds of workplace benefits that you have access to. And so the idea of, of collective bargaining and worker power is really uh, important for putting the appropriate, as we've said before, guardrails or checks on that system so that it is more true to the promise uh, that it, it proposes uh, to put out there uh, in terms of everyone having access and, and opportunity in this country. You're Alex, still on I mute. Think, I think you're on mute, sir. <laughs> That's twice, Alex, come on. <laughs> we're, we're the old ones that, are, that don't know how to use buttons on here. Come on. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm exposed. <laughs> Uh, well, look, I, I think that was one of the biggest, you know, possible framing questions that we could have talked and really to me reflects one of the biggest themes of, of, of our conversation today. Um, uh, you know, uh, for those who missed it, Dorian did drop in a, a book in the, the chat um, that we definitely recommend checking out. And there are other uh, references to reports and briefs in there as well that uh, we referenced throughout our conversation today. We've got two minutes left. I know there are other questions. Uh, we will follow up uh, with, with folks who submitted questions. Um, but if you could, you know, Dorian and Valerie, could you just leave us with some, some closing thoughts uh, before we transition to our next speaker? And we can start with uh, you, Dorian. Ooh, well, um, power. <laughs> and there's power comes in multiple forms. Narrative power, um, cultural power, political power, organizing power, mobilizing power, the power of research and empirical facts <laughs> that I want to emphasize. So um, power determines the rules and the policies. And there are multiple ways to exercise power. And especially, um, we like to say community change from the ground up. Um, but the last thing I'll say is in terms of that ecosystem approach, fund the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute to follow the leadership of Taifa Butler and Alex and others, um, but also the ecosystem in the state of Georgia. We mentioned many of the grassroots organizations that work with GBPI um, and are strategically aligned. So ensuring that there is deep commitment to making sure this ecosystem can grow and flourish even more so than it has in the last decade is this is the moment. This is the choice point. Um, you all have the power to actually support this work and to transform the state of Georgia and the country. Because as we learned on January 5th, what happens in Georgia affects the entire country, the entire country. So keep funding this work and supporting this work. And thanks for having me. It's been an honor to be with all of you today. <laughs>
this. Valerie. I also want to say thank you for uh, hosting the, your conference the entire week and for the opportunity to speak on the panel today. I think I want to wrap up with, with two definitions that I like to use when I, I talk about these issues. Uh, one being racial equity uh, and racial equity, uh, one such definition is it would, it's the condition that would exist if one's race no longer predicted uh, statistically how one fares. That's the problem. Um, race is a consistent and statistically significant predictor of so many economic outcomes. So racial equity is eliminating that statistical connection between race and economic outcomes. But the other is racial justice. And racial justice really has to do with the work that's required to get to racial equity. And so that involves uh, proactive advancement and reinforcement of policies, practices, attitudes, and actions that produce equitable access to power, opportunities, uh, treatment, impacts, and outcomes for all. And we all have a role to play in that. Governments have a role to play in the kinds of policies uh, that we pass, institutions have a role to play, uh, whether that be labor unions, whether that be universities, whether that be uh, 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 policy organizations or grassroots organizations, they have a role to play. Individuals have a role to play in facilitating racial justice. But it's important to understand that racial justice is something that requires action. And we have a clear and measurable goal, a measurable benchmark on how we're doing in the pursuit of racial justice, and that's racial equity. So I think the two of those things, keeping those two things in mind, uh, help me to stay focused uh, uh, as I continue to work and, and partner with others. And I think it's, it's useful to understand that we all have a role to play in achieving that. Ooh. Needed that. Needed that. Thank you so much for that. Action, action, action. Wow. Folks, uh, that is all the time we have, unfortunately. Um, I hope everyone who was able to tune in today feels as energized as I do. Doesn't matter if you're a researcher or an organizer or a policymaker or a funder, and you can be all of those things at once too. Um, thank you so much, Doreen and Valerie, for filling our cups with some incredible ideas today. Um, I know we're virtual, but everyone, please be sure to send a virtual applause up for our amazing guests. Uh, I, if we, I wish, you know, if we were physically together, there would be a thunderous applause in the room, trust me.